Get it done proper. <laughs> you know, we sort of give a bit of the lunch. some of the food you Yeah, some of fish and chips, which we win the award for every year. Bangers and mash. Got a Cornish patch. We even even got a curry pasty now. Oh, we just started uh, this week chicken pot pie pasty. There you go. Yeah, it's awesome. So, yeah, our food is really good. Always great to see you, man. It's good luck with England this year in the Euros. And again, you guys, at uh, 2 o'clock on Sunday, check out the Copa America. That's going to be a lot of fun. And that's going to be going on for a while, too. So, Brazil against Venezuela. Well, Tom, you know, uh, David's kind of our unofficial oil correspondent, so I'd love to hear what he thinks about the Harry and Meghan yes. and the whole, yeah. I was going to ask you, yeah, what do you think about Harry and Meghan and that whole scene there? You're a big fan. You've got to give everybody a little update. Well, I mean, I think he's doing what his mother would want. Get out of the limelight, the limelight and, and you know, live your life away from the royal family. But the way it was done, I don't agree with. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, the two most important people in his women in his life, well, now it's his daughter. But it was his wife and his and his grandmother. Yeah. And he's definitely upset one of them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but like I said, his, his, his mom would have been very happy for him, you know, to be away from the royal family, live the life and have the family. And he, but they're no royals anymore. Yeah, so they're right. just a couple living in California. Yeah, how about that? It's so great to see you. He's bringing so much joy with Rosie and the Dragon. To people across the valley. You bring so much joy. It's great. Yeah, I think it's it's awesome. guys, come watch Sack Day, man. You'll have a lot of fun. I guarantee it. Yeah. We'll watch it right here on, on Fox 10. I'll be this weekend. Bye, David. Bye, Tom. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Another episode of Not Your Average Joe by Parker and Sons. I hear you have an emergency. The AC is out and we can't sleep because we're burning up. We got this. At Parker and Sons, we're open 24-7 and there's never an extra charge for nights, weekends, or holidays. I'm all done. Thank you, Joe. Now someone can just get the kids back to sleep. Don't worry, I got this. And the little plumber went home happy. The end. Call Parker and Sons today. We're not your average Joe. They say you should wait 30 minutes to swim after you eat. Nobody said anything about slurping Arby's $1 floats. Seems like a great opportunity to slurp and splash. Arby's, we have the meat. I'm Doug Hopkins. If you're considering selling your house, make sure you get the $5,000 Doug Hopkins guarantee. We won't bait and switch you and promise you a higher amount than down the road of renegotiating to a lower price. The price on the contract is the price I'll pay, and I'll guarantee it with a $5,000 non-refundable security deposit. Just go to DougHopkins.com for your free, no obligation, guaranteed cash offer 24 hours a day. That's DougHopkins.com. Thank <laughs> you.
We all have our signature ways to serve up fresh, and the last thing you want is to run out. With prize delivery and free pickup, you can get back to free stuff on a pick. Prize, fresh for everyone. It takes power to move forward and face the challenges of a changing world.
after one of the biggest fire responses in Phoenix history, fire crews are called out to another fire at a recycling plant. So this one wasn't the six alarm fire we saw last weekend. It was a first alarm fire. It happened in Liberty Iron and Metal near I-17 and McDowell. Those structures were threatened here. Firefighters getting the flames under control pretty quickly, especially when you compare it to that big fire over the weekend, but they stayed there on the scene to monitor hot spots, the cause of the fire under investigation. And new this morning, a bad crash shutting down a major intersection in the West Valley overnight. Take a look at the scene here in Glendale near 51st Avenue and Greenway, and you can see uh, at least one car um, really badly damaged. This car on the right-hand side that you can just barely make out uh, rolled over even. It's not clear exactly what led up to that crash or if anyone uh, was badly injured. We've reached out to police. We'll get you an update when it's available. Three people were killed, however, in a bad crash in Phoenix. The accident involved a Valley Metro bus and three different cars. This happened yesterday afternoon at 7th Avenue in Missouri. In addition to the people killed, seven people were hurt. All those victims are expected to survive and still not entirely clear what led up to the crash. Left the corner of my eye, uh, coming was that east, um, just an SUV just rolling, I don't know how fast, I've seen 50, 60 miles an hour, but I have no idea, hit me, split second, which slammed me into the bus over there, five-year-old son was in the back seat, that was all my concern, so luckily he's all right, I'm all right, so we're Police say there were only a few people on the bus at the time, and nobody on that bus was hurt. And now on to the latest in the fight against a big wildfire burning east of the valley. Some progress in containing the Telegraph fire that's burning near Superior. The fire has grown to 86,000 acres, so now it's bumped it up to the ninth largest wildfire in our state's history. But it is 40% contained, and they also told us yesterday they think they've done a really nice job with the containment lines around Miami because there were some areas there that were evacuated. Governor Ducey and other lawmakers flew over those flames yesterday, and the governor said at points it looked like another planet. That was just desolate and uh, without any water or pre precipitation and, and, and lifeless, and it goes on for miles and miles and miles. That fire started a week ago, the exact cause still under investigation, but it is at this point believed to be human caused. The Mezcal fire is burning not too far away from that fire, again east of the valley, 72,000 acres, but also good progress on this, 77% containment. Several communities, though, still evacuated. State Route 77 and parts of Highway 70, though, have reopened. And then up near Flagstaff in our high country, the Slate Fire is still growing. The fire burning northwest of Flagstaff doubled in size yesterday to 5,000 acres, still no containment. There are a few structures that are threatened up there, but none have been lost. So crews are battling flames on the west side of Highway uh, 180 in the Kaibab National Forest. So that stretch of roadway still shut down. So if you have plans to go up near the Grand Canyon or, or shoot up somewhere in that area of North Arizona, you're going to have to find another route there. You can't use that 180, at least today. Maybe check on it tomorrow morning. The fire broke out on Monday. The cause is not known. And because of all of this fire danger, all state land in Arizona is now under stage two fire restrictions. The Apache Sitgraves National Forest moving into those stage two restrictions today. So that means basically you can still use the forest. I mean, the next stage is going to be when they shut the whole thing down. So be responsible this weekend, right? That means no fires, no campfires, no charcoal, coal, or wood stoves. Smoking and use of open flames banned. You have to smoke in your car if you're going to do that. Any violations could result in fines up to five thousand dollars or six months in jail or both. The bottom line: don't burn down our forests. Water levels at Lake Mead are dropping. In fact, new data showing the reservoir is at its lowest level since it was filled back in the 1930s. Lake levels have dropped by more than 16 feet in the past year. If you've driven by Vegas. Boy, you can see that big kind of bathtub ring all the way around the lake. Well, experts say it could drop another nine feet by next year. So we are one of seven states who rely on Lake Mead for water. Overall, the entire Colorado River system below 50% capacity right now. And experts say it's directly related to a prolonged drought. Nearly 50,000 Arizonans stopped collecting unemployment in the last few weeks. While more than 100,000 Arizonans continue to receive unemployment, some dramatic shift has taken place in the last few weeks with people getting back to work. A couple weeks ago, the governor required unemployment recipients to search for work, and claims since have plummeted. In mid-May, nearly 197,000 Arizonans continue to file claims for some type of unemployment. This week, it dropped by 23%. That's the lowest level since the early weeks of the pandemic.
And on to our coronavirus numbers. I'm happy to be bringing them to you today as we kind of work through the ending of the pandemic, hopefully, which is in sight for us. A lot of high vaccination numbers, and we'll walk you through what we're looking at in terms of new cases today, 422 new cases. The state removing actually two deaths from their roles there, so uh, that number going down by two. Still, we're looking at 17,740 people in the state of Arizona that have lost their lives so far. Over 17,000 vaccine administrations in the last 24 hours being reported by AZDHS. Taking you to our percent positivity, we're at 5% again this week. We've been at 5% for several weeks now, so that's definitely a good view there. I do get a lot of comments. People asking, you know, sometimes more information. If you've been with us, you know, throughout the last year, you understand and you're probably aware of what information we have access to and what we don't. So HIPAA really prevents us from having access to the kind of information that you get from people that have recovered from the virus or maybe are still dealing with some things after uh, having the virus so we just don't have those numbers to report to you but i can tell you 6.1 million doses of the vaccine have been administered so far our percentage of people that have the vaccine in the state of arizona all the way up now at 47.7 percent so that is good and you know i like this graphic right here and this is uh, rather alarming to see but you know we are looking at low numbers all across the united states so in terms of um as a whole does it look um, bad necessarily no but we are seeing some states really inch up and a virus growing a little bit as people get things more back to normal. So you're seeing uh, states like Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, uh, Nevada, Wyoming, Montana, all seeing an increase in their uh, coronavirus cases. However, Florida, we're seeing on its way down. So it's really interesting to kind of watch this right here and see what that movement does as we continue to kind of get to the end of the pandemic. Building a border barrier is back on the table, at least in one state. That's how the Biden administration stopped the border wall construction several months ago. Yeah, Ron is live with the details. Yeah, so uh, pictures in recent days have shown that the administration's claims that the border is closed are not anywhere close to the reality of what's happening on the ground along the border. So now the governor of Texas says the state is going to start building its own wall to supplement what had already been built uh, in recent years by the federal government. He made the announcement the border town of Del Rio, Texas. Governor Greg Abbott approved a state budget that includes more than a billion dollars for border security. So the start, he'll deploy law enforcement agents there to help Border Patrol. Uh, he says the massive influx, which is having a dramatic effect across South Texas, is the direct result of President Biden changing border policies that had been in place during the Trump years. Now, he did not say how much the wall would cost or when construction would start, but he made it clear that building it is a priority for the state of Texas to protect communities, particularly in the southern part of the state. The people coming across, especially in Alberta County, are changing also. It's not so much the unaccompanied minors. They're very dangerous people who are involved in human trafficking, drug trafficking, people that if you encounter, you don't know if you're going to walk away safely from. You should not have to face that danger in your community. A change is needed. And he says he'll make sure that change will uh, happen. And he actually said he'll be revealing more details this coming week uh, with specifics on the plan. It is likely to face some legal challenges from the federal government. So we'll see, in fact, how quickly that might happen in terms of legal challenges. But uh, the governor says the budget's passed, the money's there. We're going to put it to use pretty quickly, guys. All right, Rob. Thank you. Valley fever, we've talked about kind of mysterious illness yeah. in a way. I don't think we've got it totally figured out, but it's a big problem in Arizona, especially in the summer when we have those big dust storms. Yeah, Desiree is live for us, learning more about valley fever. Um, explaining a little bit of it to us. Hey, Des. Hi. So you guys know that I'm relatively new to the Valley. I've never heard of Valley fever. So really interesting what we're talking about this morning with Dr. Hatfield here at the Hatfield Medical Group. Uh, thanks for being here with us this morning. Thank you, Pam. Thanks. And for other folks that maybe are new to the Valley, can you just explain what Valley fever is? Yeah, you know, Valley fever is endemic to Arizona. And there's approximately 10,000 cases a year. Believe it or not, most of those are located right here in our state of Arizona. Okay, and what are some of the, how do we get it? And then what are some of the symptoms related to valley fever? Great question. It's a fungal infection infection that is in the earth. It's a fungal. It's a 
the fungus, actually. And so when, when the monsoon seasons kind of kick up, um, the fungus grows from the moisture and in the air, the wind and the dust storms and the haboobs that we see here in the valley, right? All of that dust and all that stuff, you think, oh, it's just dust. I better protect myself. Well, there is valley fever that resides in all of that dust. And how you get it is you breathe it in. And some of the symptoms that we see are common with a lot of other symptoms that we see with other illnesses. So think fever, fatigue, respiratory symptoms like cough, and skin rashes. Skin rashes. Okay. I thought that was an interesting symptom. Um, but do you have to have all three of those symptoms, or could you just have a rash and no fever, or would it be a combination of them all? Great question. No, you do not have to have all three. Okay. It can be one. And that's why it's so important that if you have one of those symptoms, that you're evaluated by your primary care provider. And there's tests that they can do to determine if it is indeed valley fever. So they can do a chest x-ray because it's a respiratory illness. They can draw blood. And in some cases, we need to do a CT scan, which might show changes in the lungs that are consistent with that. Okay. And can you talk about some of those changes in the lungs that you've seen in patients? And, you know, are the side effects or uh, will we suffer longer even after we've cured the fever if we have like you said, the nodules in our lungs. So because it's respiratory, right, most of the changes that you see are in the lungs, and we think, you think of like symptoms like bronchitis, pneumonia. After the disease has taken, after the fungus has resolved or the infection has resolved, we see lung nodules that stay in the lungs. Usually those don't cause any long-term problems. And, and we need to mention prevention. You know, there's not a, there's not a really foolproof great way to prevent valley fever. But in Arizona, we do need to be aware of a couple of the ways. Um, we don't want to be just outside, out and about during these monsoon storms or during the haboobs when we see the dust coming. We want to we head for indoors where we have filtered air. Um, we all have these masks left. Well, we're not out of the woods yet, but with the resolving pandemic and more folks getting vaccinated, we have a lot of masks still lying around. It's appropriate to use those masks in a setting where if you work outdoors and you're in a place where a lot of dust or dirt is being kicked up or during the monsoon and you have to be outdoors, it's certainly appropriate to wear a mask. And remember, the mask pre helps prevent getting the fungus. It doesn't it's not an infection that we see that is contractable person to person. Okay, so it does not spread. I can't catch it if you have it, and you can't catch it if I have it. That's correct. All right, how do we cure it if we do get it? So for the mild symptoms, it's usually just watchful waiting, and we monitor the patient to ensure, and we might treat things symptomatically. For a more moderate or advanced illness, there is there's oral medicines and even up to IV medicines that we would that we would use to actually cure the infection. Okay, is there an age group most at risk here? You know, it's obviously most the folks, adults that are out and about in the community. We think of people that work outdoors, um, farmers, landscapers, um, people that manage golf courses. You know, just folks that are more outdoors are more susceptible to it. Okay, all right. Well, there. Good to know. Thank you for all that information. So you can prevent it by wearing a mask if you are outside around that dust. And then certainly just stay on top of it. If you have any of those symptoms, you make sure you, that you check in with your doctor. So send that to you guys. That freak you out a little bit to ask you near the valley. What's valley fever? Um, you know, when I, when I saw valley fever on the metal this morning, I was like, what is that? Video. Right. Let's go back to my small closet again.